I just wanted to, again, just thank you guys so much for coming to this. Uh, I know it's like a little bit interesting and different for me to finally do this virtually, but this is a version of a talk that I've really wanted to give a while pertaining to a lot of the work that I've been doing in collage for many years at this point. So, I mean, thank you, thank you guys so much for coming and also thank you so much to everybody at the Design Center for uh, being so patient of hosting this. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So anyways, um, this is <laughs> this is me. In case I don't know you, uh, my name is Emily Hash. Um, I am many things to many people, but notably I'm an illustrator, an artist, a designer, an art director, and an angry New York City cyclist, although not necessarily in all of that order. Um, I spent a good portion of my career designing visual systems and strategies for brands of all sorts and shapes and sizes, but most importantly in spaces that nurture creators and artists. This has ranged from things where it's elevating music education in companies like Splice that serve musicians, DJs, and producers, to dreaming really big with designing interfaces and brands around digital art and digital art devices for your home with electric objects, to uh, selling literal shit on Black Friday with companies like Cards Against Humanity um, and doing a lot of other more traditional gaming related things with them. And then currently telling stories of craftspeople and their process for Etsy here in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm currently at right now. However, I'm here to talk a little talk tonight about a little more about those first two words I mentioned in my story, um, it being an illustrator and being an artist, and what they've come to mean to me as both a designer and an art director through the medium that I found my first voice in, which is collage. Um, I'll be getting to a few other things as well, but I think first I'd like to start off with just a little background around, around my practice and my way of thinking and especially in how I make my work because I think that that kind of relates to a lot of how I design and how I art direct and how we kind of go from there. So to start off, for me, my practice in collage has two different meanings, uh, one of art and one of editorial as well. I started off and still am an artist in many ways of the word. In a nutshell, my work concerns recontextualizing visual structure and reframing desire, mainly through different types of portraiture, um, which I've played with on and off throughout the years, but tends to be the constant stream in a lot of my work. I'm really interested in our relationship as viewers to images and our interest or our disinterest in material and particularly how we blur the line or even switch the meaning between the two. Um, to me, like this can come to life through photographs, it can come through material, the kind of the possibilities are pretty limitless. I work primarily for myself as an artist, which is also how I define the difference between art and commissioned work or work for other people like design. And for me personally, I like to use collage as a guided meditation. To me, it's a really slow, process intensive investigation of building and rebuilding forms on a small scale, or sometimes larger, and challenging my own sense of meaning around the environment towards me. So kind of working within like this also personal space, like the slide I just mentioned, but also through this larger environment, which these are actually like photos that I take as documentation from both New York and where I currently am in LA, uh, where you just can see a lot of these different forms that, you know, come to life through the city itself. To me, like these kind of concepts can include any sort of visual design or even deritus that you or I take for granted, especially in an environment that's as artificially shaped and decontextual as ours. So signage, tickets, flexible plastics, photographs, fabrics, lists, general waste, you name it. Uh, this I kind of define as vernacular. And as you can see, like this is a lot of shots of my collection. It's things that I have amassed over the years that come from too many places to name. Like sometimes, as you can see, it is old magazines. Other times it's stuff from the street. So word of warning to those that have not met me, probably don't shake hands because I've probably lifted up a few gross pieces of paper here and there. Um, but to me, it's like, it's really a process of observing and documenting these and taking what I can, even if it's something that 
might just hold interest, but I might not hold, have, in, have a use for right away. Because, you know, when you think about it, there's something that's really interesting in, appreci in appreciating and defining what this idea of vernacular is. And learning to unsee this idea of vernacular and even unsee design as a completed or even forward facing form. In terms of what I mean for the, about that, for me, the favorite parts of materials that I have or have worked on or have in my possession aren't always what's on the front, but often what's on the back. The unfinished, the trampled, the scrawled out, and the soiled, which you can see a little bit of here, but there's definitely <laughs> some more soiled stuff in my collection. Over my years in practice, I've found that it's a, almost a more honest and emotional marker of an object's ex existence, and more importantly, it's narrative. Where it's been through, where it came from, where it might be going next. And I try to explore this as best I can. And I feel like that process of exploration for me is also a thing in itself. Because when I build collages, I like to liken my process as towards that of building a house in a way. I use forms or ideas of interest to create a base structure, if you will, and continue to build, push, and stretch that. In terms of how I progress, it's adding forms of decreasing size and increasing specialty. Physicality plays a huge part in my process as well, as well as using my hands and sometimes other parts of my body to manipulate paper fibers, plastic, different types of materials, through ripping, cutting, folding, unfolding, <laughs> putting things together, and in general, letting the entropy of these materials and these somewhat random acts add new variables to what I'm working with and ultimately the shape that I'm trying to form or the image that I'm trying to frame. This is also largely why I avoid digital mediums such as Photoshop or Figma or places like that as the primary tool of creation because in some ways, as a professional designer, I almost find them too easy. They require a different mode of seeing and evaluating things that is less dependent on a layered dimensional physical form and more encompassed within an inclusive flattened plane. Anybody that's ever worked on a giant Photoshop file with many, many layers can maybe relate to this. Anyways, back to making, back to the physical world. When I'm making a collage, I go through this process often many, many times, stepping away, coming back, stepping away, not really letting time kind of guide me or time box me. But I do feel like there's a point that I always reach where I've pushed a boundary enough and I begin to eliminate and consolidate. I believe in continually questioning my work, but not myself, through a different process, which often consists of a lot of questions. Yes and, what else? And how so? And I do these as a means to continue the rhythm of working, but also to be really conscious of my own bias, my own privilege, my own ego in relation to how I see and process these images or these textures or these forms that I'm working with. I think of our, as artists, our work requires so much of our emotional selves that sometimes it's really easy to get stuck within our own internal monologues and kind of start to not see things that other people might see. And I think having that perspective, or at least keeping myself in check, especially in relation to images, which are su such a universal medium, is really important to unlocking new things with my work. To me, a piece ends when it's atomized as possible. So again, this might be minutes, it might be days, it might even be a week or two. A lot of times I end a piece only to study it and then come back to it, rip it up, and completely start anew. As even though this seems really destructive and kind of pointless, it, to be honest, I think is really important. I work with materials that are often quite precious and literally irreplaceable. A lot of these old magazines or these things that I pick up or acquire in some ways, I don't have copies of. So for me, de-emphasizing work and not getting too precious about it or getting too stressed about accidentally ripping something the wrong way or how boring a final piece is, places my mind back in the mindset of looking forward rather than back. And I think that's important for any artist or designer. The way I see it is there is always going to be another piece. And as long as I can come away sort of learning something or gaining some sort of visual insight into what I've done, in a way it's a successful piece, even if 
maybe the whole composition or something else isn't to my liking. In a sense, building collages has taught me how to be a better designer. And being a designer professionally has taught me to use that mindset of service and perspective in a formalized context, ultimately to better quote unquote see and to push my collages and my personal work. That having said, that was a whole rant about process and art and very abstract things, but I wanna bring it back into the editorial realm, however. This has been fairly recent to me, or at least over the past couple of years. In some ways, it's an interesting turn on how I've developed my vision and have come full circle towards art directing other humans, and again, seeing my work as a collage artist. A little bit about my story. I recall getting commissioned from my first job, which was actually for Medium, when I was still in college at SAIC in, in Chicago many, many years ago. And thinking it was super weird that someone actually wanted to commission me and send me an email and wanted to pay me to make a piece of art around, frankly, what else is, what is somebody else's idea. But I was a college student at the time. I liked money because money means you can get a six pack of PBR and a couple of tamales for dinner and of course pay rent. So I took it on not really knowing what it was like to be an illustrator or to think about work editorially. Eventually, I took on more and more, and I worked fast. I said yes to everything. I began to post a lot, so the work slowly started to trickle in. Eventually, it started to flood in, in waves, as every tsunami, tsunami expert move. Once I moved to New York in 2016. New York is a pretty large hub of publishing and journalism, so this totally makes sense. I eventually took on jobs, not because I had time for them, but simply because I started to like the challenge and the difference in routine from my usual practice as an artist. This is probably where I name a few of my clients. Here are my clients. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, they are all people like you with, formerly with desk jobs, probably all now working remote. But I've definitely had the honor over the years of working with a lot of different teams and art directors, which has also been super influential for me personally in sort of rounding my perspective of what it's like to see journalism, but also what it's like to see illustration and editorial images. Editorial is a funny thing because when you're working on an editorial illustration or editorial collage, there isn't always a solid process. And one of the best and worst parts are that it involves another human being, an art director, so that there's a certain chaos in figuring out each other's minds and thinking that can make it really exciting, which in my opinion is true. However, there's generally a rhythm I follow that's an extension of what I talked about earlier. With jobs, you often get a brief. So sometimes these are fairly detailed and complete and other times more often than not, they're pretty sparse. For me, it usually consists of a draft of the author's piece, often some reference materials, photographs or the like. It can be old materials, it can be new ones. It really depends on the publication and the art director and even the individual job. Everything's a little different. There's that same process of investigation I talked about that goes into that. And it often manifests through subsequent rounds. Instead of working with my own ideas and observations as the main point of entry, I'm tasked with repurposing a previously existing idea as scaffolding to sort of deconstruct it and reconstruct it in my own manner while still staying true to telling the journalistic vision of the story or the idea or the, the task that I'm being put on. Initially, I'll step back and look through the text and supplementary materials with the eye of a journalist, asking myself things like, what conveys a narrative or main points as directly as possible? What has a bit of emotional intrigue? what feels truly human, and what addresses a reader's questions before they even ask to it. And you'll notice that a lot of these questions are a bit more objective. When I work as an artist, it's very subjective. It's very addressing sort of my own sort of internal expression. Whereas with editorial illustration, I have to take that expression and flip it out and really work with a challenge of communication and understandability, but also being sure to balance that with style, you know being able to add a certain tone or notion to the piece that words alone might not just convey. Anyways, back to that. I use a lot of this as the base of my house. I seek to preserve it through the life of the piece, but again, also supplement it or manipulate it by adding material, 
whether it was provided to me or from my own collection, things that I feel like really accentuate the idea of the form. And eventually I try to let my, that material weave itself into part of the narrative itself. Again, like my practice as an artist, I seek to question context, but in this case, not so far as to abstract the idea or make it too um, distinctive from the story itself. The art director and I play a huge role in reviewing rounds and bouncing or shaping ideas based on the obligations and visions on their end. Sometimes motifs or inspiration come right away, and other times it can take a while to get there, especially if I'm working with a story or a brief that requires a lot more journalistic nuance. Overall, illustration can be quite a transactional medium. Jobs can be very, very fast. Uh, sometimes they range as little as a week to a couple days to even 24 hours in the case of certain clients. But once you're done with a job, it's really done. It's gone. It's out. It lives within a page or screen and becomes something unto its own, something out of my control. And like what I mentioned earlier, it requires you to be a lot less precious because at the end of the day, despite what you feel, there'll always be another job. And as long as you're hitting the basic points of communicating what that story needs to communicate, sometimes that's enough. However, as those jobs come in over time, I've had to the pleasure of starting to experience reciprocal working relationships with the same art directors, basically getting hired back for the same publication multiple times over. And you begin to start to see your clients as human beings and their individual points of view and their philosophies around their work or the relationship to journalism is all super unique, not just based on their publication, but again, based on them as people, as designers, as art directors, even as artists themselves. Ultimately, that's fed into a lot of where I am today, which is really thinking about a couple of points, starting off within the liminal and the abstract, recontextualizing that looseness around a defined scope, and now being the person defining the scope with creatives that myself or my team hires. As an art director, especially as one that has spent most of their career working in an in-house environment, I like to reciprocate this relationship, but again, from the perspective of my own process of investigation and more importantly, of building. Everyone is unique. It's my responsibility to ask questions, to consider the creative context of the illustrator or the animator that I'm hiring, and question my own notion of completion to include their process as well. There's a certain flexibility and abstractness that is required. And essentially, it's a two-way street to build off of each other based on direct communication and the preparedness, vision, and context that I can provide on my end. Approaching everything as a collaboration, even if it's for a very distinctive brief or very complex project that might have a lot of stakeholders or a lot of things riding on it, generally leads to the best process, and in my opinion, the best results in the long term. That's really that nice sweet spot where, you know, as an art director and as a client, you can get your needs done and your work addressed, but you can work with somebody and their own personal vision and their own personal style to also push yourself and push yourself beyond where you might have just gone initially in house. It's one of my biggest responsibilities, but also my biggest joys to get this perspective on a new way of thinking or doing based on observing, interacting, and ultimately conceptually pushing another creative human being or human beings. Like with my clients, it can be difficult sometimes, right? I have to constantly balance two sides of my job. I work for a business, often for marketing or content teams with very specific financial product or messaging goals that they need to express based on the company or the product that we work for. However, I also maintain the integrity and the sentiment of a brand, qualities which in my opinion, cannot always be measured with metrics, tables, spreadsheets, or numbers. And a lot of the times are very highly nego negotiable, very highly subjective, and always have an emotional quality to them as well. As an artist and an illustrator myself, I also don't think that you can maintain an ethical practice as a client without considering the humanity of those working for you and how you structure your feedback, your process, and your own perspective. Again, Sometimes those two can clash, and the more creative aspect of my job in, is found in resolving that relationship, just as how 
I have freelancers working with me. I am also the freelancer as well. So it's kind of coming full circle. And there's always something kind of reminding me and grounding me in the way that I work and in my practice. Although to be honest with you, most days working in house as an art director and designer, I do feel like I am the UN general counsel in terms of this relationship that I described between the freelancers that work for me, but also for um, the stakeholders on my side internally. But again, like in my practice as a collage artist, I think there's always something to be resolved in this idea of contrasts. This, this contrast between material, between ideas, and ultimately between relationships. Because in a lot of ways, all three are sort of essential to building the house of your dreams, or at least in my dreams. And ultimately, that's what I hope to keep exploring further. And that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody for tuning in. And also, I'm definitely ready to take any questions. Even if you don't have questions now, you can always email me anytime based on this talk or even just to say hi. And check out my work on Instagram, which is where I pulled a lot of these classes from. Thank you so much. So everyone, um, you can unmute yourselves now if you like and ask a question, or you can um, type in the chat if you prefer that, and we'll be looking and um, asking. Ah. In Zoom, no one can hear you clap. That is true. <laughs> um, so this is a question from Jess asking, is there any particular way you organize your physical archive? That's a great question. Um, I really wish I was able to put a picture of that in here. It's a little bit difficult because I'm actually away from my studio back in Brooklyn right now. Um, but yeah, in terms of like organizing the physical archive, it's kind of organized by weight. Like I have a lot of it basically on just like a large series of shelves and bookcases in my studio where um, I tend to collect a lot of whole magazines and large books. So those sort of sit in bins at the bottom. And then I have a few drawers above that hold more loose materials that hold kind of larger papers of different sizes. And then there's bins above that for like papers of sort of smaller sizes, smaller scraps. Whenever I start a piece, I think there's always a lot of time that goes into just like going through my archive and I find that the process of like sifting things, taking things out, putting them on the floor, playing with them a little bit is often really important to just deciding an idea for a piece. So there's another question from Alexa asking, what helped you in reaching out to publications slash companies to illustrate for them? Um, that's also a super great question. I really have not done a lot of reach out. I know that I have a lot of friends that are also illustrators that do tend to send uh, cold emails, mailing lists, or get in touch with art directors in a lot of ways. But to be honest with you, a lot of art directors have just found me through Instagram. Um, oftentimes art directors kind of watch like bylines of other publications. So if I would do a piece for a certain magazine or a certain publication, I definitely find that once I post that on Instagram, I get a lot of traffic coming into my email inbox because they see what are the other art directors are doing and that probably gives them ideas. But yeah, it's like pretty organic, which sometimes is a little scary because you don't always have control over that. Work does tend to ebb and flow. But um, yeah, really it's just been like being consistent about posting work and putting it out there. There's another question from Patrick. Um, do you use your own materials for all collage projects or do the clients ever provide imagery? Um, the technical answer is both. With a lot of um, client-based work, especially like super journalistic stuff, they will provide imagery, particularly if it's like a profile on a specific person or a specific event. And depending on the art director, they might provide more or less imagery. Um, but I always use that in combination with my own objects. And I try to amass a pretty wide collection of stuff to just kind of touch on like every type of tone or piece that I'll work with. There's another question from Jeremy. How do you, how do you know when to evolve your style and when you know to let go to something you experiment with? Oh, this is like, <laughs> this is a hard hitting question here. Um, it's a really organic process. I think I try to spend less time thinking about 
consciously evolving my own style because I can't spend my life full time as an artist feasibly financially so I've had to like accept the fact that evolving a style will come a lot more slowly than somebody can, who can be in a studio all day so I think for me really evolving style just comes through practice and through constant making and through just trying out a lot of new ideas but instead of trying them in super big radical ways, trying them in super small ways. So it feels like there's less risk and less uh, stuff at stake. And really just kind of continuously working and not worrying about too much. Like when I go and check my Instagram of pieces I made like two months ago, six months ago, nine months ago, it's crazy to see how my style has evolved, whereas I might not really realize it in the moment. Well, thank you. Oh, thanks. Nice to see you. A question from Jackson. Have you ever made a collage using a piece of material and then later on wish that you hadn't and you hadn't used that particular piece of material in that particular collage, i.e. a photo or graphic you wish you had saved for a later project? Does the finality of your process ever leave you with regrets? Um, I don't like to hold regrets, especially with uh, artwork. To be honest, it never leaves me with long lasting regrets. Um, I might regret something like super quickly in the moment, but for me, um, especially if it's like a illustration piece or something and you know, the defect is quite minor, like if it's a rip or tear away, away from somewhere that I don't want it, um, there is a chance I can always fix that in Photoshop. If it's a physical piece, then I instead just try to reframe it as like another challenge or another piece of scaffolding that I'm dealing with and not really something that I wish I had back. Patrick asks, how often do you turn down clients and for what reasons? Um, that's also a great question. And I'll kind of answer it backwards in the sense that like, uh, reasons often depends on like timeline because I have a full-time job and like many of you, it, your workload always ebbs and flows. Um, I really have a better idea of like what the scope of project I can take on. So I tend to turn down jobs that are really poorly defined or take way too long. Oftentimes these are jobs that are not editorial. They're like for brands or for um, super long, you know, week long or weeks long or month long projects. But in general, I don't really turn down too much work. Most editorial work I will take on. Again, I've only turned down editorial work if it's like I can't make a turnaround. Um, but so again, some of these larger brand projects I do turn them down, but oftentimes it's just because I don't have the time. A question from Ben. What have you learned about putting together briefs for illustrators? What do you like slash prefer to see in briefs that are sent to you that make you more or less excited about a project? What's a good brief? What's, what's a good brief? I think I'll, I'll try to answer the what's a good brief section and maybe that'll like answer the rest of the question. Um, I think for a brief, like as an art director, you really have to go in like knowing everything about the context, but also knowing what you need to stay fast on, stay hold on, but then what things you're open to some more interpretation on. So for me, if I'm doing this from a brand or a company, it's really educating um, on a couple different things. First of all, the overall style that I'm looking for, that might be mood boards, that might be some description of it, that might be showing some examples of the brand that like Etsy, you know, we might need to fit a style into. Um, that's often co context about the project, you know, telling about, talking about it from like maybe a journalistic or a marketing perspective, but then also context from like a conceptual perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also the most important part is just really being defined in what you want, mm -hmm. which surprisingly is not always the case in a lot of briefs that come across my way. For editorial briefs, there's really key, a couple key things. How much you're willing to pay for the job, when it's due by, possibly when the first round is due by, and then the general subject of the work. And then if an illustrator accepts that, then they'll usually get a sort of second brief that um, gives them the story. It might give them like deep, more details on the work. It might give them reference materials. And for me, that's usually enough to get going. For a brand, it's a little bit more of an extensive kickoff, but I think really the main thing is just providing a lot of context and a lot of details, financial and timeline up, up front. 
have another question. How do you allow yourself to continue to accumulate materials without, without feeling afraid of letting yourself get hoarderish? This is like a good question, especially for those of us that live in New York City or any urban place where we have small apartments. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think every time that I move apartments, which fortunately hasn't been recently, but in the past would sometimes be every year or every other year, I would do like a big um, deep clean through my library. So I would really kind of quite literally Marie Kondo it, where I like kind of go through my collection of books and sections and like one by run and really sort of look at something and kind of decide if I have a use for it, if it really feels meaningful to me again, or if there's elements that feel replaceable and kind of slim things down by that, especially when faced with the necessity of moving. Tony asks if you have any favorites among your own work um, and if there's a common element or aspect between them. Um, that's a great question. I, it's hard to pick favorites because like, I think a lot of my pieces like don't really belong to like series per se or have really defined names. I kind of like to let everything stand on its own out into the ether somewhere. Um, but I really do like working with um, work that contains like hand-drawn elements. So a lot of like line work, ink work, whether it's stuff that I make personally or stuff that I might find. Uh, lately, I've been like really into picking up, um, the, the word for these would be like slaps, but we see them as like graffiti stickers that you might find on like a mailbox or a wall somewhere. If you're you know in New York or LA, you'll see these everywhere. And often those are something that like artists will leave to leave their own mark in a way that that's, that's less permanent than uh, spray painting. But I often find those like having fallen off or on the sidewalk somewhere and they kind of become part of this urban Derridus. But they have this like really interesting handmade element to them that I kind of like to take but also recontextualize in my own way. Alexa asks, when did you discover you wanted to do all of this? In other words, when did collage transition from a hobby to a, to a career for you? Um, I think it really started to get into collage like late in high school, maybe like early in college. I had a teacher that just, an art teacher in high school that really just started by like assigning us a collage assignment. And I began to felt, fall in love with the medium that way. I think it, it was always really frustrating to me when I would be in art class or art school and we'd have to work with materials like paint or ink or pens. And I never felt like rendering those things. I had a lot of control over it, but I think collage allowed me to like get a level of precision and control over my work that just felt super nice, but also let me to use this sort of like designery sort of thinking, constructing building brain that also felt super nice. Professionally, I think it was really like I mentioned that medium piece probably occurred maybe when in my second or third year of college and then things were kind of spotty until then, but then, you know, Back in 2016, when I moved to New York, I think that's when things really started to accelerate. Kelly asked, have you ever considered doing a gallery show to showcase all of your work? I have done gallery shows, actually. Uh, more so in Chicago, where I'm from. Um, I had a lot closer relationship with the artist community back there. And also, uh, what's beautiful about the art community there is that it's a lot more DIY. It's a lot more accessible. Um, and it was much more easy to show work by myself or with other artists. As I moved around, I have less of a relationship to galleries, especially now being in New York, the gallery scene is very uh, commercially driven in a way. And I kind of just don't have access to that. But I think if there is an opportunity that came up, I would definitely be into it in the future. Jackson asks, considering the amount of found media in your work, do you ever struggle with ideas of authorship or ownership over your work? It really depends what you define as authorship or ownership. A lot of the authorship or ownership that I immediately think about comes from a legal perspective because I do work with other people's images, especially if it's a piece that's for a public medium, like a publication or a brand. I do have to think about, you know, rights of use and making sure that like I do have artistic usage and that I'm modifying the piece enough that basically I won't get sued because there have been instances where artists have gotten that happen to them. Um, in terms of 
authorship or ownership from like a personal perspective, I don't really struggle with that as much. I really think that like a lot of the process I described and a lot of the like thinking and thought that goes into it on my end feels enough. And, you know, I find that most people that see my work also tend to interpret that. Jess asks, what do you use to hold your work together? And if there are any tools that you recommend? Uh, yeah, I also wish I had a picture of that too. I have a different, a different variety of like glues and adhesives. Um, if we want to get super technical here, I really recommend using dry adhesive. There's a couple types of adhesives. There's like wet adhesive, which is like Elmer's glue, like you, you know, your typical sort of sticky stuff. There's dry adhesives, which some may say glue sticks can count of. Um, and then there's like spray adhesives, which is like spray glue. Wet adhesives, I tend to think like warp paper and they kind of mess with really delicate things. So I stay away from them. Spray adhesives are terrible for your lungs and you should never use in an enclosed space. So I use a dry adhesive um, called Scotch PMA. Basically it's this giant roll of sticky paper that you place materials on, you rub the back of them and as you peel them off, it basically makes like a pre-made layer of glue on it. And then that allows me to stick it to something and have a pretty permanent hold. In terms of other tools that I use, I mean really just scissors, exacto tape or exacto knives. I use a lot of double stick tape when I'm like playing around and positioning things. Like if I want to glue something together but not have it be permanent, move it later, um, that's super helpful. And yeah, sometimes straight edges or rulers, but it's pretty minimal. I have a question about sustainability in your work and how much do you use um, recycled materials or how much do you feel like your medium can kind of say so much about sustainability? Um, I would say aside from the materials that I use to adhere my work, pretty much everything I use is recycled in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah, I guess the only exception, again, would be like if I am printing out or using an image that's provided to me, there's not much I can do about that, but it's so minimal that, you know, most of my work is recycled. In terms of like sustainability or talking about a larger sort of environmental thing, I can't say that that's something that I exclusively focus on in my work, but I do let that message come through if people want to interpret it that way. Alexa asked, can you talk a little about the digital aspect of your collages? Also, thank you from before. Oh, you're welcome. Um, the digital aspect to me is often concentrated just on post. So basically, I'll make an image to a pretty high fidelity um, physically, and then that'll be scanned in. But when you scan it into a computer, you just lose so much like resolution and depth and color. There's a lot of colors that a scanner can't pick up. If you've ever scanned like a neon piece of paper, um, that just doesn't come out. So it's often more like from a photo retouching sensibility where I'll have to go in and I'll have to like adjust colors to look good on a screen. Um, if it's gonna be in print, you know, I have to like make adjustments for that, clean it up. Um, if it's, sometimes it's a rare situation where I'm working on a super tight deadline and the client you know, again, an editorial client might have like a super specific image they want to use. And in that case, I have sometimes made collages, physical collages in different pieces and components that I'll like then assemble back in Photoshop and maybe add an image that the client wants to use. But generally, before I do this, I already have a pretty defined idea what the piece looks like. So the whole creation process, like I described in my talk, really doesn't occur in Photoshop. I have a question if I could ask. Sure. Um, when most of your work is, is kind of on a smaller size, mm -hmm. I think because of the, um, you know, the amount of pieces that you use in that um, collage work, have you ever worked on anything that was um, like a much different scale um, or wanted to? Um, I think that's a huge thing that I've been thinking about a lot. I really have not because to me, like usually different scale means that I will just have to make a piece in a smaller way and it has to get blown up either through 
printing of some manner, which I'm comfortable with in certain instances, but I've never been able to really work with like assembling or work physically making a piece that's like extremely large. Although that is something that I would definitely like to do. I think it's really at this point is just like, I don't have a lot of space and I also don't have materials that are large enough, but maybe someday. If you want me to, I'll go around and steal a bunch of billboards that you can cut from. <laughs> Indeed, there's, there's a lot of billboards in LA that I'm sure no one will notice if they're gone. I have a question actually. Um, is there a project that you, or maybe even another medium that you haven't explored yet that you would like to try? Um, and that maybe you're thinking about trying out? Um, that's a great question. I think for me, I've always wanted to explore a little bit more of textile work. I think maybe it's a little untrue because I have done some work with like making, designs and having them printed on onto textiles but I've always I, when I went to school I actually had a lot of colleagues and classmates that worked in the fiber arts and I never had a chance to like really um, take classes in that or explore that unfortunately but it's definitely been something that I feel like has a lot of similar process to how I work as a collage artist but you kind of have that added sensory medium of like touch and dimension depending on what you're doing and yeah I think that would be something I'd love to explore and seems very appropriate during uh, quarantine times as well. Absolutely thanks. Of course. What was one of your favorite projects that you worked on like a higher piece? Um, like for a client you mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think I've done a lot of work for a publication called MIT, MIT Technology Review. It's associated with the, um, the school, obviously. Um, I think it's a little bit more, the publication itself is a little more, more independent from the school, but I've really liked working with the art director there and just her sensibility about um, using analog collage in ways to address issues that often deal with like digital technology. Um, I think one of the one of my favorite pieces from there was uh, talking about the conflict in Syria and um, what some of the like folks on the ground there in terms of like gathering like digital data evidence of war crimes happening there, how it actually worked out for them or sometimes didn't work out for them. And yeah, it was just really interesting to work with like found video footage and sometimes kind of grainy material that just came directly from some Syrian hard drive somewhere, but was able to be recontextualized in a way that felt very physical and, and very like kind of close to real life. So is that like a, like a, um, a video or a photograph? Oh, that was a, that was a collage illustration. Um, it was a couple for like a big feature story in the magazine. Uh, awesome. Um, there's a question from Cherry. Do you ever get worried that other people can't understand your work? Um, or how do you tailor to clients' needs while keeping the integrity of how you want to design them initially? That's a great question. I think there's a couple answers to this. Um, in terms of understanding work as an artist, I don't really get worried because in a, as an artist, I make work for myself. And, you know, the ideal situation is to like, be able to be as true to myself that it does come off to other people. But ultimately, it's like not up to me whether they want to understand it. It's not up to me whether they want to like it. Um, it's really like as long as I'm happy and satisfied with the process, like that's what means to me at the end of the day. In terms of like more commercial work, like editorial illustration or even design work, um, usually that's worked out through the process of working with the client or the art director or the team internally. Um, because at the end of the day, it does have to be understandable. Um, tailoring my work to the client's needs, this is, this is the super tricky question in terms of like back and forth. Um, I do find that I'm fortunate that people approach me already knowing my style and my type of work. Um, so that's a little bit easier, but you know, I try not to be too precious about it. And I think for me, as long as I'm listening and communicating and empathizing and doing my best to communicate whatever is needed in that situation. Um, that's what I try to get out of it. And sometimes I do end up with pieces, especially editorial pieces that aren't totally to my liking. But again, as I said, 
there's always going to be another one. And it's just important that I really hit the mark on that. Um, Jackson says that I brought up the idea of video work and have you ever considered further blurring the lines between digital and physical work by animating your collages, either digitally or through traditional stop motion animation? Um, I haven't. I, to be honest, that's a question I'd have to consider more because I think it would depend less on the medium, but more the type of animation used because professionally at Etsy, one of my specialties is I actually do a lot of art direction of animation. I work with a lot of animators, um, often folks out of house, but also in house as well. Um, so I've also been around a lot of different types of animating. And I think when you're working with very physical or very textural materials or elements in animation, um, sometimes the line between like getting it really good and true to the medium can just take a lot of work and a lot of effort. So I think it's definitely worth exploring, but I think there would definitely be quite a learning curve to doing so. Just Pie in the Sky asks, do you ever have an emotional or ethic quandaries over using other people's found photos? Um, occasionally I do. Um, it kind of goes back to that like discussion about using modifying it and using it in a way that's like expresses my artistic intent over just simply like slapping a thing on top of a photo. Um, there are some types of photos that I really try not to use like found family photos or photographs or snapshots or things that feel very like intimate or intended for not a large audience are things that I really try to avoid just because there's sort of like an emotional resonance to those objects as like precious things that just feel off for me to even modify. There are some exceptions in editorial work where I've been provided those photos, but that's usually uh, at the request of the art director. And in that case, it, it feels more cool. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, if anybody has any last questions, um, feel free to either, you know, you can unmute your mic or you can type it right in the chat. Um, I actually do have a question about um, maybe there's some prospective students who might be interested in going into illustration um, and maybe they're hesitant, you know, and, and maybe not as comfortable um, pursuing a creative career because, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult to break into these industries. And do you have any advice from your perspective or things that you wish you would have known um, coming right out of school um, that would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, the paths are definitely different, whether you want to be an illustrator, animator, a designer, or even something else. Um, so I feel like it's like slightly different answers for everything. I think for illustration, um, some of the main points I can say is it location sometimes does matter. I do find that being in New York or the East Coast where there do tend to be more publication work, if that's something you want to pursue helps. I think that having a presence online, particularly through Instagram is super important. Um, that's really how most art directors, including myself, like find artists and find work. Um, and especially if you're getting tagged in other people's posts or it's just sort of like being super collaborative with your work or your projects. Um, I've found that that's kind of a way that I get eyes on my work or at least new followers. But it's also really important to be very balanced about that as well. Like Instagram, it can be a really powerful professional tool, but it's also not a venue for your own self-worth. So it's not always really about having the most followers or anything. Um, it's really just more about, you know, being more conscious about your work. And then I think style wise, it's also really important to have a very, you know, developed and sort of unique style, especially if there's a particular type of work or industry you want to go after as an illustrator. You know, I know some illustrators that love working in games. So really thinking about what, what type of illustration work does exist in games and then what you can do to kind of fill that void is super important. For other things like editorial, it's really more open and it's really more about just having a distinct and ownable style. And then I think the last thing, and I can say this as an art director, is really having a variety of work in your portfolio as well. 
um, especially when I hire people for Etsy or even when I was at Splice and hired people for editorial work, I just like to see that they've worked with a lot of different clients or worked on different projects of different scales, that they can think conceptually about the difference between telling a journalistic story versus working with big concepts for a brand. And if somebody doesn't actually have the opportunity to do those work, they can definitely do self-initiated projects that kind of fill that void. Jeremy asks, have you, how have you found the quarantine change your work or process in any way? Um, in terms of like artistic intent, not that much. Um, right now I am away from my studio in Brooklyn. I'm actually temporarily in LA for the time being. So I've had to like, in order to do work, I've kind of had to like construct a little bit of a studio here, which has actually been super fun in just like, learning to find the best magazines on eBay again and sort of like spend a little bit of money, of course, but be able to kind of bring things in. Um, but yeah, in terms of quarantine, I think I'd like to, once I do go back to New York, I would like to use this time to just start to explore more different projects as people have mentioned and um, really be able to focus a little bit more that you can't always do when you're commuting or working all the time. Terry also asks, which you kind of touched on a little bit, um, where do you usually find vintage materials? Um, for larger materials like magazines or books, I've found them through eBay, A books, uh, you know, yard sales, library book sales, a lot of like book sales or yard sales or even recycling centers, especially in like small towns, like going outside of large cities, people know the value of these things in large cities. But then when you're sort of in your parents town or traveling somewhere, it's kind of easier to find these things for really cheap. Um, there's a lot of like charity uh, gift shops, St. Vincent de Paul's sort of like um, thrift stores and stuff in like super small Wisconsin towns that I've found like the greatest magazines in. As for smaller materials, like those come again from those same sources, sometimes from the street, sometimes found inside old books, sometimes things that I pick up at work, just a little bit of everywhere. Um, kind of similar, and I was thinking about this too. Um, is there a threshold on the value of the book and your willingness to cut it up? Yeah, I think for me, um, I do keep some books as design objects, if particularly if they have really visually interesting layouts or they happen to have work from a designer or an artist that I admire, um, or if there's like typographic work in there that I feel like would be good for me to reference professionally again and again. Um, for books that I tend to cut up, um, it tends to, I tend to have like certain things I look for, particularly like large amounts of photographs, photographs of people, photographs of different scenes, um, paper quality that's particularly thin, which you get from materials that are between like the 50s to the 80s. Um, and yeah, like I think kind of dividing between those two, but most of the things I seek out are things that I intend to cut up. Sean asked, how do you balance having consistent output on social media with providing yourself time to slow down and not feel too pressured to post? Yeah, I think um, for Instagram, particularly, which I think this is maybe more what it's referring to, I actually don't have consistent output. Like there are a lot of times where I've just posted once a month or maybe a couple times a month. And I find that like in thinking about the algorithms that run this thing, they tend to boost posts, boost your posts when you either post very little or post a lot. So kind of having this middle ground of like almost constantly posting at a regular pace doesn't really always work so well for you, which is super weird. But honestly, I have not found that posting too little has hurt me too much. And also it's like, you know, I do have a day job that provides for my needs. So I don't feel as much pressure to constantly be posting. From a more artistic perspective in terms of like continuously making work and then eventually posting it. That is something that can be a struggle for me. Um, I do try to keep myself to like a schedule of making work normally when I'm in Brooklyn. Uh, sort of quite literally scheduling time to sit down and work in my studio much as like I would if I was doing my taxes or something else. 
I really help keep myself to that cadence, even if I don't feel particularly creative during that time. For me, it's simply really putting headspace and thought and heart into doing it consistently enough to keep producing, and again, to keep producing for myself. All right, well, if there's no further questions, um, I just wanna thank Emily so much for doing this talk, and we're so excited to have you, and it was so inspiring and interesting, and I'm really glad that we had a great conversation. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, and we hope to see you at the next design talk and have a great weekend.